Hi, I'm Mark Kwan. Thank you so much for joining us to celebrate the 20-year anniversary of Vice Institute. 20 years ago, I was just a young general dentist who loved dentistry. I started a small local evening study club. The venue was my tiny little three-operatory clinic, 15-inch laptop, and a box of pepperoni pizza to share among the five study club members. Some of those members are still with us today, and you know who you are. Thank you so much. Tonight is the episode number one of the special series. I have chosen a topic on full arts therapy, of course. It is one of the live recordings at the 2023 New York Megagen Symposium. It is a special topic dear to my heart. Over the past 27 years of practicing implants, I've learned so much on this very topic. And many valuable learnings for me was through facing many of my own failures and solving difficult complications. So, this presentation will tell you my story, the good, the bad, and the many challenges I faced along the way. So, here it is. It is titled, The Next Evolution in Full Arts Therapy, No Bone Reduction FP1. Hope you enjoy it. First of all, I want to thank everybody. Um, I'm super excited to be up here. And for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to take you into my world of full arch treatment. And it is a minimally invasive approach to full arch treatment that took me many years to discover. And I'd like to start with a little bit of disclaimer because we all want to do our best for our patient. But some of the things that I share may not coincide with some of your philosophy that you heavily currently possess or how you treatment plan yours. But I beg you, if you open your eyes and open your mind, and more importantly, open your heart, maybe, just maybe, we might find something, a pearl or two together. One of my passion is watching movies. I don't have much time, um, but whenever the chance that I get, I try to pick a movie which inspires me. Because good movie forces me to reflect my life and my journey against it. And one of the movie that I enjoy watching that made an impact in my journey was Interstellar. It's a movie about, it's a movie about a man leaving his family, travel to the galaxy to find the answer to humanity's survival. You see, the earth is dying, it's re losing its resources, no longer can sustain the human race. It's an impossible mission, and for me, my impossible mission was fighting identitialism. And my journey in implant dentistry began in 1997, when I first graduated dental school. Placed my first two dental implants on my patient, Mrs. Bach, on the upper left premolar implant on the, I don't know, the American number is a 2425. And it took me three hours. It was, I was sweating bullet. But the reality was that, you know what? You always remember your first. And those implants still survive, but that was a drill, first love at first drill. And from there, it progressed. In 1998, I treated my first full arch case, which was, like many of you, started with a denture. Placed the two implant on the bottom. It was an implant over denture. But I soon come to realize that patients don't want dentures. They want teeth. The teeth that they don't have to remove. And in, 19, in year 2000, I attempted my first implant full arch case. I placed as many implants as I can on the top, grafted as many as I can, because I know that some of those implants will fail. Why? Because I wasn't a very good surgeon. I wasn't really very good. I was inex inexperienced. And it took me almost two years to complete this case. And even when it did complete, it was mediocre at best. And in year 2004, something amazing came into my life of full life treatment. And that was, of course, as many of you know, as all on four treatment. As many of you know, the all on four concept is developed by none other than the great Dr. Paulo Malo in Lisbon, Portugal. The concept is actually so simple that it's revolutionary. And I'll go over it briefly. 
What is the minimum number of implants that is needed to support a full life treatment? It was number four. And four implants placed in the canine position and a molar, first molar position will suffice that. But the problem is this. When we place our implant that far back, we often have to do a sinus lifting. And we wanted to avoid that. So therefore, we put the implants a little bit closer together, don't we? But when we do that, what happens? We don't have enough AP spread. So by tilting the implants just a little bit, we can increase the AP spread just a little bit more, and thereby we minimize the cantilever to one molar. That's great. And it also give us a second advantage, which is we're able to place slightly longer implant, thereby grabbing the dense bone right below the nasal cavity. And this is going to be important. Why? Because we wanted to give our patient fixed prosthesis on the same day, immediate loading. However, because we're angling the implant, we need to find a way to compensate for these angular deviations. How do we do that? There was a company called Nobel BioCare, and they had this ingenious invention, what we call multi-unit abutments that we know today. It can correct the angulation all the way up to 30 degrees. And when we place this multi-unit abutment in the patient's mouth on our implant, what we're able to do is provide what we call wraparound fixed prosthetics. This was amazing. This is a surgery I've done 15 years ago during the live surgery, um, demonstra demonstration surgery. Here, we just like Dr. Canyon uh, Keeney have uh, demonstrated, I used to do everything analog. We'll have a dentures come in, make the dentures, and we'll do the surgery. We'll place a two implant at the lateral position, and we will have a little uh, uh, assessment hole on the anterior wall of the sinus, and we'll tilt our posterior implant so that we can stay away from the sinus, and we can convert the denture on the same day, and what happens is, all of a sudden, voila, they have a fixed bridge. And patients were so happy. So for even a, a you know, novice surgeon like me, intermediate level, I was able to do this wonderful fixed bridge and, and teeth in a day for my patient. And of course, from 2004 to 2017, many advancement has happened, didn't it? Digital, guided, Surgery is one main of them. I started with the Nobel Guide, and then I got introduced to in sequence, and soon later to Chrome Guide, and Stackable Guides, and I was, to, I was able to shorten my double arch surgery from three hours to one and a half hours, and that's significant. And year 2017, we reached a monumental number of 1,000 arches. I don't know about you, but for anybody, 1,000 is a lot of arches, don't you agree? However, when I follow up all my cases, not everything was happy and rosy. And I come to understand that there was some downside of the treatment that I was rendering. And I mind you, these, these uh, complications don't happen to anybody else but me. Because we don't really often talk about it, but I was not very confident that what I was doing may be the best way of doing so. But what bothered me the most is not about the implant failing here and there, because complication can do happen, but what, how I started to perceive myself was that I felt like a guy with a big hammer. A big hammer. And I started to look at all my patient cases as a nail. And what I'm talking about is bone reduction. Every time I grab my big burr and I'm reducing the bone for prosthetic space or to hide a transition line, there was a little voice in my head telling me, do we really need to remove bone, Mark? Do we? If it was your, your mouth or your wife's mouth, is this something that you're willing to do? And honestly, I wasn't so sure anymore. Because the reality is this, guys. The ultimate goal of dentistry has always been to restore form, the function, and the longevity in a minimally invasive manner possible. And we call that biologically driven dentistry. And for the past two decades, we all worked so hard how to do a minimally invasive, preserving the soft tissue, how to create more tissue, create more bone when we need to. And one of the greatest achievements is that in dentistry, we're able to create something out of nothing. Isn't that wonderful? And this is something that we do routinely now. There's a lot of literature to back it up. It's not even a question of doing immediate implants. It's successful. If that's what we are all trying to aim for, and 
if this is something like this, we will second guess it. Is this acceptable? Why does all the prosthetic has to come to look like this? Those are my cases. Is there a better way for me? So the search for an answer for me began. And like always, my answer to my question was outside dentistry. And it came in the form of a TED talk. One, one Sunday afternoon, I was watching a YouTube in a TED talk, and Mr. Guy Kawasaki did a 15-minute presentation. He used to work for Steve Jobs at a company called Apple, and his job was to create innovative technologies. And the presentation title was called The Art of Innovation. And what Mr. Kawasaki was saying is that the innovation does not happen in a progression. It happens in the leap. And to explain this concept, he took a one business type and business about ice business. Ice business version 1.0. In the early 1900s, one of the booming seasons of business was ice harvesting. A company will hire many big men, big horses, they'll go to the Great Lake and they'll carve out the block of ice and they'll sell it to the customers, hotel, restaurant, and the households. And the definition of scaling the business was hire more men, bigger horses, go to bigger lake, and get more ice. Fast forward 30 years later, ice business 2.0, invention of ice factory. We no longer needed horses. We didn't even need many men. Now, ice factory can produce ice regardless of the season. You can make the ice throughout the four seasons, sell it to restaurant, household, anywhere you want. And the definition of scale of business for the owner of the ice factory was get a bigger factory, more factory, make more ice. Fast forward another 30 years later, we have a fridge. Invention of a refrigerator made a household be able to make ice at the comfort of their own home. The amazing thing is that this invention was disruptive. Once the ice factory came on board, ice harvesting disappeared. Once the refrigerator was invented, ice factory disappeared. And the important thing to note is that the person who's in charge of making the refrigerator or fridge was not the person who was owning the factory or the harvesting. It takes a separate mindset to create something innovative. So. I did something that all men and women who get inspired after watching a TED talk. I went to the bank and got a loan for $10 million and built myself an ultimate implant center. It's an entire four, fifth floor. It's a 14,000 square foot. And I created an implant center that I only dreamed about. Out of all the facilities that I have, one that I am most proud of and most important was the in-house dental lab. It is my personal research and development center. I have three CAD CAM printers. I have five 3D, uh, three CAD CAM milling machine, five CAD CAM printers, and I have seven technicians. And I've dedicated that, you know what? All I'm going to do is eat, sleep, and learn about implants. So the story goes. I invite you to the concept of NDR, FP1, TND. It is a short abbreviation for no bone reduction, fist prosthetic, category one, teeth next day. And what was important is that I go back to the drawing board. Instead of trying to improve my all on four, all on X, let's start from the beginning. And I have to rethink everything. Instead of doing a wraparound with a thick pink acrylic or pink porcelain, let's do something different. And instead of using angled multi-unit abutment, let's do without it. Let's go to fixture level. Because we're going to fixture level, let's put implants straight up and down. Because we're doing implants straight up and down, now we've got to place more implant, especially the posterior. That means we need to do sinus lifting. Boy, that doesn't sound familiar. But what we get in return, my objective is provide our patient with an FP1. Because, you know what? What we learned over the years is that about the emergence profile, how those immediate implants that we do, how we can design the emergence profile, how to design the pontic so that we get the most optimal tissue response. We know that. So my definition of a full arch treatment was a summation of two anterior implant, two premolar implant, and two immediate molar implant. And when you add them together, joined by pontic, now I have a fixed prosthetics.
It's so simple. And in return, what I get rewarded is this. Because I'm not cutting bone, I'm not removing tissue, I don't have to raise big flap. Surgery is minimally invasive. And because I'm only replacing what they're missing, the tissue response is excellent. So when I put the two cases together, 2015, this was my typical full leg treatment that I used to do compared to 2020, what I do uh, uh, since then, there's a drastic difference. However, the one biggest difference is that I no longer reduce bone, and by one common goal is immediate loading, because I still wanted to immediate load my cases. Now, that poses a challenge, doesn't it? The challenge is this, and I'm going to explain to you how I've achieved it, and it's the concept of hybrid guide. There's a two dilemma, two obstacles that I face trying to achieve this protocol is that one is because I'm not using angled multi-unit abutment, the implant is going straight, and I want to immediate load, that means that I need to find a way to achieve initial stability, good initial stability. And I decide to put two parameters together. One is digital, the other one is analog. Let me explain. The term hybrid guide that I use is a combining the precision of a guided surgery and the haptic feedback of a traditional freehand surgery to achieve predictable initial stability. In my opinion, R2 gate is one of the most accurate guide systems that I've ever used. I haven't been doing implant dentistry as long as uh, a canyon, but I've done fair share, and I've used many, many guide systems, and R2 is one of the most accurate, especially when it comes to a tissue bone, because I'm not removing bone, it's a tissue bone guide. But however, the problem is this. R2 gate surgical guide sleeve is at 13 millimeters long. That's one of the longest. That's why it's so accurate. But because there's so much of a friction when I'm trying to fully guide it, I personally had a problem. I couldn't really gauge how tight the bone is. So what I decided to do is that I'll do the initial guide with the R2. I'll go to the maximum distance of 11.5 millimeter, and then I'll remove the guide. And I'm going to freehand it from there on. And the drill of the choice for me that gave me the best haptic response is a denser drill. Not only I use a denser drill to densify the bone, but I can also cut the bone. And the greater thing about denser drill is that it can grow with me because it talks to me. More I use it, I depend on it. And I'm going to follow the discipline, the, the parameters of how I do immediate implant. Two implant at the front is going to be two immediate anteriors. I'm going to follow all the guidelines. Instead, it's going to be a buckle junket, palatally positioned, and properly positioned, oriented, and because they're going to be joined together. And I'm going to fill all that missing bone area with a sticky bone, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Okay? Second dilemma, second challenge for me is because I'm not reducing bone, now i got to grow bone. Opposite, isn't it? And the, for me, the best way and easiest way to grow bone is using a PRF sticky bone. Many of you probably already know, but for those who don't know what the PRF is, it's just a simple way of drawing some blood from a patient's arm. We spin it a certain RPM protocol, and it makes a bone graft very, very easy to handle. Oftentimes, I don't need anything else but sticky bone. I don't need to use a membrane, and it heals wonderfully. And the third parameter is a design concept, the concept of zero bone loss concept of Thomas Linkovicius. In my implant career, no concept has forced me to put the implant with a, such a precise depth control. And I call that of a rule of a four millimeter. What does that mean? The most ideal implant depth when you're doing this protocol is that the implant has to be at least four millimeter below the buccal gingiva. When you do that, it gives, has enough of a running room for proper emergency profile of the design, and it gives you the best biological tissue response. And also, when you're designing a temporary prosthesis, it's very, very important that we open up the embrasure. We're so taught to push the tissue, push the tissue. Yeah, you can push the tissue, but when it comes to interproximal embrasure, it is absolutely important that we leave the space open deliberately to allow the tissue to migrate into the natural papilla position. Number five, immediate loading. We're going to immediate load, not on the same day, but the next day. Why? Because we need time to mill our prosthetics. I'm going to talk about that later. And this is a patient comes by one day later, and I don't have, we just remove the healing abutment, 
There's no freezing required. It sits right in, it's screwed on, and occlusion oftentimes is perfect if we plan it properly. And let me tell you a little bit more about that. So before I finish off, I'm going to show you one case. Okay? There's so many variations, and I cannot show every single cases, but this case, I think, is going to encompass most of the things that I talked about. This is a case that I did three years ago. His name is John. John is a 67-year-old man with a little bit of hyperpressure, which is well controlled with the medication. Obviously, his teeth are failing. We call it terminal dentition. His chief concern is that he can't chew, he hates his smile, and his teeth hurt. This in trial photos. Now, those of you who do full fixed arch cases will agree that this is not an easy case. This is not. Anyway, you slice it with any technique that you use, okay? Over close for many years, on uneven plane, his video is, is, is a collapse, and we need to create a new occlusion. So these are the recipe, okay? I'm gonna place six implants, and I'm gonna place them like this. That's my goal. We're going, to, we're going to do a full arch clearance, and we're going to do the bilateral sinus lifting using PRF only. I developed a procedure where I can do a lot of window sinus lifting in less than 10 minutes on each side. Okay, I had to develop my surgical skill in order to achieve this. And importantly, because my implant is going to be a fixture level, it's important that I make sure I choose the right implant design that's going to give me the optimal chance. My implant design that I choose has to have a certain criteria, and here they are. First, it has to be a tapered implant so that I can modulate the under-prepping depending on the bone density so that I can give myself the best chance of initial stability. Number two, it has to have aggressive thread design, again, to give us a, an edge into getting a proper um, uh, immediate uh, uh, loading. But most importantly is this, because I'm placing implant where the implants are going to be coming out at a singulum, even in a perfect position, it has an inherent angular deviation. So I need a connection design that's going to be able to still compensate for that and have a passive fit in a fixture level. And for me, criteria is that conical connection with 11 degree divergence. When you have 11 degree, 11 degree, you got 22 degree, and that is ample. And I like magazine implant because I like the surface treatment and everything that we talked about this morning. I wanted to choose an implant from a magazine lineup. And for me, for the zero bone, no bone reduction FP1 concept, the best implant lineup is anyone. Isn't it surprising? Why anyone? Because it has every feature that I need. And we also know that the famous zipper study is that one of the best connection that gives a minimal micro gap is a conical connection. So here it is. First, patient comes. I'm establishing vertical dimension of occlusion. I love digital, but like Dr. Kenya Kinney said, I'm an old school too. I'm really good at using wax rim. We add a little bit of a barium, make it radio pack, and most important is that I get a repeatable occlusion. This is absolutely important. I don't care which camp you are. You can be Panky, Dawson, Neuromuscular, Elvia, it doesn't matter. Just get it right. Get it repeatable. Once you get the repeatable bite, you score in the bite uh, restoration material, and you tell the patient, sir, no matter what happened, even during the earthquake, you don't open your mouth. Come with me. I literally drag him to an x-ray machine, and we're going to spin an x-ray in an R2 studio. R2 studio is a large volume x-ray machine, CBCT. It has a feature, certain feature. One is, not only can take a full head cone beam CT scan so that I can do a cephalometry analysis, just like JC Kim talked about, but it also has the ability to capture your facial scan so that we can merge it later. And you can do it all in the one sitting. And with that information, I take the, the wax rim out, send it with the preliminary model, send to the patient. Now what they can do is first they look at the R2 Studio and assess the smile line, incisal the length. Once we know that we got the good guesstimate of the incisal length is, we export that file into an ExoCAD. And ExoCAD, from there, we do most of our designing work right there. And this is what we are proposing the occlusion from there to the new design of the teeth. And what we do is now we resend that information back to the R2. Now we can put the implant where we need to put in order to support that imaginary outcome. And with that, we're going to make a 3D printing. And 3D printing, guys, 
It's so amazing, so easy, and they are so affordable nowadays. So we create this 3D uh, printing. We print surgical guide, we do a surgical pickup, and surgical stand. And I'm gonna tell you why we need all those, okay? Right, on the surgery day, here I am smiling, okay? 70% of my implant dentistry is full arch. And to me, full arch is the most relaxing day because I have my five assistants, they all know what they're doing. Just like uh, Dr. Kenya Kinney said, team is so important. And here, we have uh, a Densa drill, we have an R2, and I have an R2 uh, a gate uh, map all plastered over the wall, and this is how the surgery goes. I'm gonna go pretty fast, because I cannot re you know, really explain all the detail. First, you measure the initial video, and you do the full clearance, and you fit in your surgical guide, and you place your pin. Extraction is important because I want to do minimally invasive extraction because the less you flap, the more accurate the fit of the tissue bone guide is going to be. And once you nail that, and we're going to do an R2 gate drilling, and it's not a full R2 drill, it's not a fully guide. Fully guide, Isaac's going to talk about that. I'm not that as good as Isaac, so I got to do a hybrid guide. So I do my initial drill of 2.0, and I work up to 11.5, and I remove the guide. And then I, Densa Drill takes over. Densa Drill gives me a feedback. I do a next drill, okay, this bone is a little bit loose. I'm gonna reverse and instead of the osteo densification. The bone is a little hard. I'm gonna go forward a little bit. It talks to me. It talks to me. And then I'm gonna place my fixture one by one, one by one, and I repeat that for the mandibular arch as well. And then we use a horse, open horse uh, uh, a shoe, surgical stand to verify that position. Verify that position and make sure that they're acceptable. They're not going to be absolutely this is the same as the way we, uh, um, way we planned it. It's going to be good in a ballpark. And we're going to place a five millimeter tall healing abutment because that's going to give me the, the gauge that my implants are probably deep enough. If they're not deep enough, I'm going to sink them a little bit more. And patient go home with the healing abutments. And there's your patient. And then he goes home. And for us, the real fun begins, which is post-production. We're doing a first design tune-up. From the pickup impression, we tune up a little bit because the implant is going to be a little bit deviated from the initial plan, but it's going to be pretty close to the ballpark. And we're going to use a cat cat milling machine to mill the PMA prosthesis. And the procedure is pretty long. For a single arch, it takes anywhere from four, four hours. For a double arch, it takes like eight hours because it's a sequential. Milling can only happen one arch at a time. And of course, the design is important. We want to make sure that we open up enough embrasure. Patient comes back next day, one day post-op. I don't know how tissue heal until I start to do this protocol. And it's amazing how well the tissue, tissue uh, heals up. Look at this. Because the, the incision was so small, there was hardly any reflection. Tissue is healing without much swelling at all. And we insert that bridge that we talked about. And here's the patient. I'll show you. Look, look, okay, smile for me, right? See that? It looks so good. Yeah. It looks so good, right? Yeah. So natural. Yeah, very good. Now, very you will bite your lip and tongue, okay? Mm. That's what's going to happen, okay? Mm. Because he's, he's a new bite, he has to get used to it. I'm slow down. Yeah, and slow what down. I what I want you to want him to do, exercise. Open, close. So what I'm explaining to the patient is because close, we've drastically changed the video. In the morning 50 times, I'm giving a physiotherapy instruction. Okay. That will help 50 times in the morning. And, uh, and 15 times at night, okay? that's 100 times a day. When you do that for one okay? week, we, we got that, that bite. Okay? Yeah. Until we got that bite. We, we nailed it on. That's a patient. Does it look like a patient a double arch done a day ago? Two weeks post-op, chlorhexidine stain, typical. But look at the four months later. Look how beautiful tissue is filling in. Beautifully filling in. A lot of the areas I thought that I need to do connective tissue graft, I didn't have to do it. You give them space and tissue will find it. And then patient is ready for, four months later, for full arch final restoration. We do ISQ reading, look at the pontic site, and I do a traditional open tray impression. Yeah, you can do photogrammetry, you can do a lot of things, but it doesn't really matter, does it? Whatever, you get a good result. And this is a final prosthetic. A final prosthetic is not a wraparound. Because we're doing a fixture level, we can do a segmented. More basic, the better in my opinion. If this patient ever moves out to a different country or different city, any average general dentist can serve this. 
nothing fancy. I used to do zygoma, I stopped doing it. Because when a patient moved away, nobody wants to take those cases on. And here is the final product, top and bottom. Good old, screw retained, segmented, fixed bridge, FP1. Here's the x-ray. Here's a patient, before and after. Now, by this time, though, a lot of you are going to wonder about this. Yeah, that's nice, Mark. You have this big practice with all these machines, seven uh, in-house lab technicians. What about us? What about us? Well, guess what? I totally get it, okay? Not all you're going to have a resource to what I do, but welcome to the world of 3D printing. For many years, I was waiting for this time. When would 3D printing technology evolve so that the material science catch up, so that the strength of the 3D printing material is just as strong as cat can milling? We're almost there, guys. We're almost there. Now, how I make the temporary um, uh, immediate bridge, we no longer mill anymore. We print now. We print. Instead of taking so such a long time of four to seven hours, we're able to print this 45 minutes, both arches. Now, mind you, you got to do a little bit of staining, but that's easy to do. And what does 3D printers do? They print. They're very affordable. They're easy to maintain. CAT CAM milling is not easy to maintain, but printing is. So that's how our workflow has changed. This is before and this is after. Over the last several years, we were able to treat many of these patients without having to remove bone. I haven't removed bone for the last five years. It is possible. We've done close to 500 arches in the last five years. And my practice, I think it's pretty, I think there's a demand for it because I'm doing an average of about 15 to 20 arches a month and I'm booked out till end of August. And so this is my livelihood. And I think there's a, definitely a demand for that. Ultimate goal of dentistry is to restore function, aesthetic, and longevity in a minimally invasive manner possible. And I call that biological driven planning. And in my honest opinion, with the technology that we have today, I believe that there's no longer need for bone reduction. By no means, what I provide my patient is better than their own natural teeth. I believe the creator, his intention. I believe that, you know, mother nature, Teeth are way better than what I provide. But I do believe, even though there's a far way to go, we're one step closer. In the movie, it says, we've defined ourselves by the ability to overcome the impossible. We count these moments. We aim higher. We break down the barriers. We reach for the stars. We make the unknown known. We count these moments as our greatest, proudest achievement. Thank you very much, everybody. Hope you really enjoyed the mini presentation. Once again, I thank Minek for the New York Symposium invitation to share this presentation. If you have any questions, please post them in the YouTube reply section. I'll make sure to reply to all of them. Also, we're trying to grow our YouTube channel. Therefore, don't forget to like and subscribe to receive notification for the next episodes. And don't forget, those who are joining us live are entitled to receive one AGDC credit. The next speaker to celebrate our 20 year anniversary special is none other than Dr. Jeff Lee. So stay tuned to receive registration link. Once again, on behalf of Bice Institute, thank you, take care, and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.